dear student friends indeed it's a joy for us to be part of gurukul which commemorate celebrate and remember the giants who have contributed much to the theological education and more than that to ignite the fire of new theological innovations new theological articulations and this made us tremendous impact in the theological education and the society and the church and today we are privileged and we are happy to have the endowment lecture of reverend dr arvind p nirmal the pioneer of dalit theology so before we begin this program may i request the college team to invoke the presence of god by singing a bhajan Thank you friends 
Now may I request our beloved loving Boa Sachin to come and offer the opening prayer. vulnerability wonderful opportunity you have given to us as ap nirmal environment lecture we have been fascinated by ap nirmal's excellent contribution towards dalit theology God, Dr. Vaithi Vinayaraj, profound Dalit thinker, excellent orator, and eminent writer. We love you for giving him as a resource person for this endowment lecture. God, be with us in this academic deliberation. Let us enjoy this session. Let us be benefited. Bless us all. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Etchan. The endowment lecture. Gurukul has a long tradition of celebrating the life and the contributions of great theologians. After Reverend Dr. Sandra Basmatari took over the leadership of this college last year, year before last, we have revived the endowment lectures and we had these lectures last year online and this year we started organizing this seminar, uh, endowment lectures physically. And today we are privileged to have this seminar. And so may I request our dear respected principal to have the introduction to, uh, about AP Nirmal and about this endowment lecture. Good evening to all of you, those who are joining online and those who are physically present in this auditorium. Hadi, welcome to you all. Just to say a few words again, this is third endowment lecture for the academic year 22-23. On 6th August, we had Rajaratnam Endoman Lecture. On 8th, we had A.G. Augustine Endoman Lecture. And then September 25th, we had Prasanna Kumari le Lecture. Oh, fourth, this is fourth one, yes. And today we have F.P. Nirmal Endoman Lecture. And then one more is remaining. Nirmal means Endoman Lecture on 11th February, same that 11th November, 11th February. And we are privileged to remember our stalwart in theological field, and particularly those who have contributed in the life and ministry of Guruku and theological education in wider context, in a church and society in India. So once again, I take pride just to introduce once again this program that is Endowment Lectures. And then by God's grace, 
we are able to connect the family members. Which family members were disconnected for some years. Even we didn't know where the family members are. But by God's grace, God is leading us to search them and find them and get connected. Of course, other endowment lectures, they are close by. And particularly this endowment lecture, Epi Nirmal's family, we had little difficulty where they are. Even I didn't know how many children he had and all. But by God's grace, some people led me. One of his son is in Chennai itself. Why don't you call? I'll give you the number. <laughs> then I got the number. I called him. Then he responded, yes, I'm very much in Chennai. And later I discovered another son is there. About whom I'm talking about is Makarind. If children are joining, hearty welcome. Makarind, who is right here, but he's busy. He said, I won't be able to, but I will inform the family members. He's one. And then another one is Milind, by name Milind. Nirma is another son. And also a daughter, Elizabeth by name. All these three children, somehow we could contact over phone as well as over mail. Now we are somehow connected. We will connect very, very tightly in near future. So I'm really thankful to God, all those things. And today as we sit together to listen to the Andaman Lecture, F.P. Nirmal Endeman Lecture, pioneer theologian of the theology. And we are very much privileged once again to have a person who is expert in the field in the theology. That is Reverend Dr. Y.T. Benera among us, the director of the seizures. I don't know how many of the students know what is seizures. Okay. Christian Institute for Study in Religion and Society. We have left in Bangalore. So, Penera Sir had this as the director. So we are privileged, sir. Thank you so much for accepting our invitation. Of course, I just made a phone call to him. Sir, are you free on 11th of November? We have a Nirmal Endowment Lecture. And then without any hesitation, Sir said, yes, I am free. I can be there. I was so pleased. At once, we got Director of the Seizures, YT Benares among us. So we are so pleased to have him. And that we respect your willingness to come, Sir. And then as a mark of our honor, we want to honor you now with our traditional way with Saul. So may I request, yeah, yeah please. And along with our chief guest speaker, I once again welcome all the online participants as well as the participants sitting here in this auditorium. Let us sit back and listen to YT Veneras. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for introducing the purpose of this endowment lecture. After independence, there were two dominant discussions prevailing in the theological communities around. 
One was on Christian participation in nation building. And the other one was the Indian Christian theology. A.P. Nirmal was a professor in UTC. At that time, UTC was also very much involved in promoting or discussing the importance of Indian Christian theology and indigenization of worship and contextualization of theology and so on. And people like uh, Sanjay Chakrai and followed that Russell Chandran under the leadership of Dr. Russell Chandran, the uh, principal of UTC at that time. And then Dr. Yamam Thomas, then Dr. P. D. Devanandan. They were all involving in the indigenization of the gospel and interfaith dialogue and so on. But when they were busy with talking about Indian Christian theology, the importance and then the concepts, the panikar and all these discussions were going on in UTC, in one of the valedictory functions of UTCSA, UTC Student Association Valedictory Service, Dr. Yepi Nirman dropped a huge bomb and that was Sudra theology. That was the beginning of Dalit theology. And he questioned the caste hierarchy. And in fact, he was even questioning the nature of Indian Christian theology. And he branded Indian Christian theology as the Brahmanical theology. Remember, now it is easy to critique on any theology, but in 1970s, when the entire theological world was occupied with the Western theological thinking, remember that how difficult it was to brand a particular theology as Brahmanical and then put a first step towards the need of a paradigm shift in theology. So the Sudra theology was introduced. And then later on, he developed that Sudra theology as Dalit theology. And ultimately he was questioning God what kind of God are we talking about? And he took Deuteronomy chapter 26 as the base, questioning even the dominant gods, the images of God. And then he went to the bold step of even using the word servant God. My God is a waiter, my God is a servant, my God is a dobi. So, such powerful affirmations he was able to make. And he interpreted the word Son of God as Jesus in solidarity with the oppressed. So, I had the privilege of meeting him and listened to him first time in 1994 in UTC when bishops pastoral theologians, people who were teaching Christian ministry under the Senate of Sarambur system, we had a seminar. And that was an effort to form APT, Association for Pastoral Theologians. And our bishop, the then moderator, Victor Premasazar, was also in that meeting, and many theologians and uh, even uh, at that time, uh, Russell Chandran and Yamam Thomas, such giants were also present in that meeting. I still remember the way he was questioning the theologic theologies of the time, the dominant theologies. And even now I remember he mentioned 
two things i did said so many things but then i could recollect only two things very powerful statement and he was even saying to the extent in front of the bishop saying that let us stop the church business because church you have heavily damaged the society let us stop the church business secondly he was even questioning the word use of the word pastoral ministry pastoral he said the word pastoral is a hierarchical term a power centered term and so he was proposing people's theology people's ministry instead of pastoral ministry people's ministry because we are working for the people and so he even uh, suggested to name this uh, forum as association of people theologians not pastoral theologians definitely ap normal deserves the recognition and ap normal uh, theology needs to be uh, communicated from one generation to the other many times we forget the pioneers of our uh, theologies but in between somebody hijack the theologies and then they pretend as if they have they are the pioneers but gurukul always we remember the pioneers of our uh, theology and and today we are really privileged to have reverend dr white vinayaraj the alumnus of gurukul he did his bd in mathoma theological seminary kottayam and mth here maybe he will be able to say uh, more about that his time and his phd at the lutheran school of theology at chicago university and i have seen his uh, uh you know curriculum vitae i think i need more time then so i will cut short some of his contributions he served as the registrar of navjot postgraduate research center in new delhi he has written numerous articles and books and few of his books let me read dalit theology after continental philosophy reclaiming meninas rereading mm thomas reimagining reformation empire multitude and the church empire detailing theological musings and recent books faith in the age of empire political theology in transition and maybe later on with this list i have up to 2020 and every year almost two books and presently he is the director of sisters christian institute for the study of religions and society next to utc we have this program and i am so personally i'm happy uh and i should also say in front of uh everyone that maybe after a decade sisters has got a right person as its director because sisters has been contributing a lot in the theological education and in the in new theological uh articulation and so that waiti vinayaraj is the right person to lead this institution and sisters is publishing religion and society maybe many of us uh, refer that uh, journal and definitely the sisters will be revived again more and more in the days to come and already the process started and we look forward his ministry more meaningfully and this evening we are privileged to listen to him he is the right person to talk about uh, dr ap nirmal and so now i give this time to dr white vinay raj to give the lecture thank you please take the time
Good evening. Thank you, Dr. Peter Singh, for the kind words of introduction. It is indeed a great uh, honor and privilege for me to be to see a speaker of uh, Nirmal Memorial Lectures organized by Gurugul Lutheran Theological College and Research Institute. Gurugul is my alma mater. So coming back to Gurugul, for me, is an experience of homecoming. Thank you, Dr. Songram, for giving me this wonderful opportunity to visit Gurugul campus once again and to cherish some of my old golden memories of life here in this campus during my MTH program that was in uh, 2004 to 2006. I take this opportunity to pay homage to my mentor, guide, and well wisher. Dr. Jajaratna, the founder, director of Gurugul. Actually, it was uh, Dr. Jajaratna. After completing my MTH here, he said, Vinay Raj, why don't you go to Lutheran School of Theology, Chicago, for your doctor studies? He made all the arrangements. And Dr. Songram, it is it was part of the faculty extension program of Gurugul. That means still I have a claim. Don't worry, I'm not going to disturb you. And uh, let me acknowledge the contributions of UCL. Uh, ULCI General Secretary Reverend Joshua Peter that he is extending to Success Christian Institute for the Study of Religion and Society as its executive committee member. And I'm happy, very happy, so happy to see some of my friends, faculty colleagues like Dr. Senior, Dr. Peter Singh, Dr. Prasunya, Dr. Morris, Dr. Giri, Dr. Arvind, all are my friends. Thank you very much for this honor. Thank you very much for being present this evening with me in this hall. I had the rare opportunity to meet and sit in the class of Reverend Professor Dr. Arvind P. Nurmala in 1990 at this campus when I was attending a program organized by Student Christian Movement of India, Tamil Nadu region. The program was conducted here in this campus. At that time, Gurugul had a 
special separate department for Dalit theology. Professor Nirmal was the director, Dr. Deva Sahai, now Bishop Deva Sahai, was the associate director of Dalit department. An immense materials produced by Summer Institute of Gurugul. Now, Summer Institute is going to be held in Holy City, right, Dr. Songram? And the change, development. And at that time, Gurugul was the only center for Dalit theological studies in India under Sarampur Senate. And the materials produced by Summer Institute of Gurugul are still the only authentic resources for doing, doing Dalit theology in India. Thank you, Dr. Songram and the respected faculty members for maintaining that legacy even now. Today, I'm not going to give a detailed description of the theological articulation of Nirmala. Dr. Prasuna can do better than me. And uh, Dr. Peter Singh has already initiated a very brief but sharp, you know, explanation of the contribution of uh, Dr. Nirmal and the context of the emergence of Dalit theology. And my aim this evening intention is to read Nirmal and see the possibility of developing a theology of religion out of his literature. As a student of theology, I use some, most of the time I use some academic critical lens. Now I am trying to read Nirman, whether there is a Dalit theology of religion in his articulation. So the title of this presentation is Talit Theology of Religions, Nirmal as Guide. For the new theological students, this is Nirmal. And the, there will be three questions uh, in this presentation. Number one, how does Nirmal define Talit religion? How does Nirmal define Dalit religion. Number two, question number two, what is his understanding of religion when he relocates Christianity as a religion of Dalits in India? What is Nirmal's understanding of religion when he relocates Christianity as a religion of Dalits in India? This is my hypothesis. Nirmal is not happy with the normal form of Christianity. He engages with Christianity in order to de-doctrinate Christian theology and make it a useful weapon for the emancipation of Dalits in India. So in Nirmal's literature, we can see a new understanding of religion even that questions Christianity as such. This is my hypothesis. Third one question, how does Nirmal's understanding of Christianity as a Dalit religion impact theology of religions in India in the contemporary context of religious fundamentalism and cultural fascism? So how does Nirmal's understanding of religion or Dalit religion, or redefining Christianity in India, how does it help Dalits, not only Dalits, for all Christian faith communities in India to define their own religiosity in the contemporary context of cultural fascism and religious fundamentalism. I know that, you know, Theological students are here. I promise you, I will not use any hard words. It will be very simple. I will make it as simple as possible. 
and uh, there is nothing new. We all are familiar with these kind of things. So just trying to explore normal understanding of religion and what is the criticism that he brings out when he engages with Christianity. He is not happy with the normal Western Christianity. He is trying to come up with new kind of religiosity and what is that? I don't think uh, you can read it. I'll explain it, don't worry. Number one, how do we define Dalit religion? At this point, I don't try to define religion as such, but I will give you some of my concerns, definitions of religion in between. But let me start with defining Dalit religion. There are many different approaches in terms of defining Dalit religion. Number one, considering Dalit religion as the pre-Brahmanic -pre tradition. Considering Dalit religion as pre-Brahmanic tradition. The people like Kati Patma Rao, M. C. Raj, Kancha Elia, they go with this point. Dalit religion is a pre-Brahmanic, before Brahmanic tradition. It is pre-Brahmanic tradition and anti-Brahmanic tradition. Have you seen this book, Charvaka Darshan? Have you seen this book in your library? Who published it? Gurukul published it. This book is published by Gurukul. It is there in the library. In this book, Kati Patmarao, you can never see a book on Charvaka tradition any other place in Indian Theological Academy. The only a protection is from Gurugal campuses. Now, according to Kati Patmarao, Dalit religion is a pre brahmanic tradition. Let me quote M.C. Raj when he defines Dalit religion. He says, Dalit religion is original authentic Indian indigenous tradition. I quote M.C. Raj. Dalits were nature worshippers. They worshipped the sun, the moon and the five elements. They even had hero worship but no image or idol during these, those days. These were introduced only after the Aryan conquest. So Dalit religion as the pre-Brahmanic religion. The second approach what is the relation between Dalit religion and Hindu religion? What is the relation between continuity and discontinuity between Dalit religion and Hindu religion? There are many approaches. Let me highlight uh, four major approaches. Number one, syncretic approach. Syncretic approach says that, you know, Hinduism can accommodate anything, even Dalit religion. So Dalit religion is part of Hindu religion. Hindu religion is comprehensive, can accommodate anything, even uh, Dalit religiosity. Ekam sat vipraha bahuda vadindi, one truth, many interpretations. So Dalit religion as one interpretation within Hindu religiosity. That is one interpretation. There are people who believe like that. Number two, Dalit religion as a deviation within Hinduism. Dalit religion as a deviant religion. Hinduism is nothing but Brahmanism. Legitimizes caste system. So we cannot go with Hinduism. There should be a new way for Dalit religion. Dalit religion as deviation. The third one is conflict. No, Dalit religion cannot find home in Hinduism. It is nothing but Brahmanism. Reject Hinduism. The conflict within uh, Hinduism. You know, Phule, Mahatma Phule started this conflict within 
Hinduism and initiated new theological explanation within Hinduism like Bali Raja, those kind of things. You students, you know all these things. Finally, new religion. Dalit religion is not connected with Hindu religion, Hinduism. It is a non-religious. The ideological position for this stand is called conversion approach. So the relinquish, the name, come out of uh, Hinduism. Dalit religion has nothing to do with Hinduism. It is outside of Hinduism. Of course, the person behind this ideology, philosophical approach is Ambedkar. So we, we were trying to define uh, Dalit religion and uh, what is its connection with Hinduism. Mainly I was trying to define Dalit religion as pre-Brahmanic as well as anti-Brahmanic, anti-caste uh, tradition, counter tradition. And what is the second point? What is the content and practice of Dalit religion? Actually, what is the foundation, foundational doctrines of Dalit religion? Three things can be seen in Dalit religion. Number one, inculturation. You know, in the weaving, give and take symbolic expressions. So Hindu symbols are being used by uh, Dalit religions. So you can see some Hindu gods and religions. So enculturation is there, give and take. Number two, resistance. You know, you cannot go with Hinduism. Dalit religion as an expression of resistance to caste system. Total resistance, conflict. And rejection, reject Hinduism, reject religion. Some Dalit, you know, philosophies even gone after atheism also. So these three things can be seen within the understanding of Dalit religions, inculturation, resistance, and rejection. Three major things that, you know, explains the doctrinal foundation of Dalit religion. Number one, concept of sacred. Dalit religion can be seen as a, a challenge, contradictory philosophy, and critique of Brahmanic Vedic understanding, religious. So the counter Vedic concept of God. If, if Brahmanic God is sacred, holy, then Dalit God will be a polluted God. And it is a powerful God. This power gives to worship as Shakti. The, most of the Dalit gods are the goddesses, female god, Shakti as a god, concept. And the understanding of sacred in Dalit religion is localized to deities, Kula Deva. That means, you know, in local uh, Songram's language, it is human and transcendent. So you can experience the faraway god closely to you, you can even approachable, you can even, you know, uh, satisfy that God, that is your local God. So there are many Kula Devams in uh, Dalit religions, like Elayaman in South Tamil Nadu, Mariamman near Madhurya, Potanthayam in Malabar, uh, you know, founder concept of God. It is not... Uh, it does not go with Vedic, Brahmanic understanding, counter concept of secret. Number two, worship. You know, worship is the major component of all religions. What is, what does it mean in Dalit religion? Worship is, you know, retaining friendship with God. That is the ideological thing behind Kula Deva, local deities. So they have uh, rituals appeasing Kuladevam, worship, individual worship is there, collective worships are there, and even we can see some possessed individuals who can speak the language of divine, and the person who lives in between divine and human 
they speak a different language to human beings. These, you know, kind of rituals, worship, you can see in the Dalit religion. And of course, the expression of community life. These are the people who have no community at all, a tortured, segregated, marginalized community. So they imagine their own community through festivals. Festivals were part of their religiosity. See the uh, festivals like Amavasi, Pongal, uh, these are festivals of Dalits, but later they have been Sanskritized and elitized. All people, like the Onam in Kerala, this has become a common. This, these are actually Dalit indigenous uh, festivals connected to Dalit religiosity. And third major content of Dalit religion is music, art, and drums, musical instruments, because most of the Dalits were illiterate. So instead of preferring militant text, they tried to invoke God, divine, through music, art, and especially drums. Drum, you see, drum beating is one of the religious activity of Parayas in South Tamil Nadu. And it was Satyanathan Clarke who has written a wonderful book on Dalit religiosity, Dalits and Christianity, subaltern religions and uh, liberation theology. In that book, Sati Clark uh, writes, Dalit religion is the site of reconfiguration of subjectivity and creation of emancipatory re Two things. Two objectives in Dalit religion. Number one, reconfiguration of subjective, new beings, new worship, new God, new beings, right? Number one. Number two, new symbols, you know, initiating new symbols. According to Sasimadhan Kark, Dalit religion is a factory of counter symbols. The drum for Dalits is an act of resistance, number one. Number two, it is an effort to reaffirm their own identity and subjectivity as the agents of this history. This is the meaning of symbols. So Dalit religion as the uh, you know, laboratory of counter symbols. These are the major, you know, doctrines, doctrinal understanding of Dalit religions. And final thing in this uh, section, uh, according to Dalit scholars, religion is not philosophy or metaphysics. It is a social movement. This is very important definition of religion uh, for the Dalits. For Dalits, Religion is nothing but a social movement. It is a historical movement. And religion is not belief about you know, origin of the earth and the other world and the journey of the soul, nothing. Religion is a social movement through which it tries to empower the untouchables, marginalized people to become subjects of history. So Dalit religion is a social movement. There is a clear philosophical, ideological, and theological foundation for Dalit religion. But it is so unfortunate that uh, Christian theologians have never looked into the indigenous content of Dalit religion, foundations, doctrinal foundations of Dalit uh, religion. And it is so fortunate that in Nirmana, we can see such kind of some point is and signpost, whether it, you can even reconstitute Christianity as an indigenous Dalit religion in India. I have shown here uh, a book, Shudra's Vision for a New Path, edited by Kanja Elia and Karuku Somi. This book gives us a detailed historical formation of Dalit religion. I don't want to go in details, just give you some signposts. Number one, it begins with Charvaka Logayata tradition. As you all know, students of religion, you know that you know Charvaka philosophy is a material philosophy, a part of the Indian original philosophical tradition. 
it was a counter brahmanic tradition counter vedic tradition so vedic theology denied the validity and significance of body matter and the world the advaita philosophy is wonderful i don't i never understand sorry for that uh, maya world is maya and this is this uh, mrs maya can be you know uh, accommodated if atman you know wills like that sorry what kind of uh, philosophy it is and the, the, the basic of this understanding is world is maya body is ma- maya matter is maya only so who is so what is so brahman can think about so the charvaka tradition said there is no soul this is to inform you that soul is no more only body matter and the world transform the body transform the matter through new relationship that is philosophy of love that is philosophy of life there is no soul no transcendental logic that you need to look for to come from above no transcendence body life world renewal as the alcoholic water as spirit in it just like you know matter is vibrant matter it has its own capacity to renew itself so the dalit religiosity find its ideology theology and philosophy in this kind of indigenous counter brahmanic traditions number one charvaka number two buddhism begins with ashoka no a great definition for religion religion is not ritual christian theologians please listen uh, this interpretation religion is not ritual it is not about hierarchy of pastor ordinary ordained and unordained for the sacred and uh, secular woman and man there is no dichotomy religion is nothing but moral consciousness dhamma ethics new definition that is that was very new to indian continent for us religion is metaphysics and doing some rituals no rituals no metaphysics religion is a moral consciousness that is nothing but ethics you know transform your relationship that is the final goal of religion and god if you bring god god will not come alone as a, our film actor rajinikan says he will not come alone he will bring you know other uh, i don't want to use that language he will bring other paraphernalia right god will god in religion ritual ritualistic tradition will not come together will come with hierarchy patriarchy and uh, you know dichotomy separation of holy place unholy place unholy people holy people don't bring this invoke this god we need a, a god who is nothing but karuna compassion and utamba buddhism thanks to buddha and uh, the third uh, according to this book third historical trajectory is basavanna lingayat karnataka you know that you know common worship no segregation in believers linga shiva linga open come and worship it is part of bhakti movement in 20th 12th century guru nanak and sikhism in uh, punjab no caste no idol just worship i was am reminded of the conversation between uh, conversation between the samaritan woman and jesus now what is the content of this that conversation she says you know your uh, parents and grandparents are worshiping god in that mountain and our parents are worshiping god in that mountain how come this integration of this worship that was a you know content of that dialogue then after the conversation they travel together by singing a duet saying that neither this mountain no that mountain but there will be a time when we worship god in spirit and truth amen hallelujah and this is a new kind of neither that mountain no 
this mountain. No cross, no idol, but it is a movement of people together. Sri Narayana Guru just let me invoke uh, the tradition from Kerala, one caste, one religion, one God. And of course, the uh, Phule, Mahatma Phule and Truth Sikhs. Religion is slavery. Religion is nothing but, you know, gives us more burden. Not to move that side, not to go this side. Do's and don'ts, don'ts, don'ts. But give me a religion of freedom and justice, where you have no boundaries of seclusion, marginalization, and discrimination. Give me a religion of justice and freedom. Mahatma Phule. And the last one who cannot be avoided in this discussion, and this is going to be the last point of this uh, session, that is Ambedkar. So the a historical formation of Dalit religion in India begins with Charvaka Logayata tradition, comes to a conclusion or completion, a kind of a challenge with Ambedkar. What is Ambedkar definition uh, of religion? There are three sources for Ambedkar to define religion. Number one, Charvaka Logayata material philosophy. Then of course, Buddhism. And third one, Marxism, a new modern understanding, a critic of religion, critic of ritualism, critic of other world religiosity, critic, critic of religion as a metaphysics. Bring this religion to the world of people, mundane world. This is, these are the three resources. Ambe, Ambedkar defines that. Hinduism, see that uh, book in which Ambedkar defines religion, Buddha and his Dhamma. Ambedkar was searching for a religion who can offer justice and freedom to all. He didn't find it in Christianity. Christian theologians should think about it. He never embraced Christianity. You should ask Ambedkar why. And uh, he uh, found some productivity in Buddhism that we need to think about it, why it happened, why it is not in Christianity, Christian theology. And this is the book, Buddha and his Dhamma. According to Ambedkar, Hinduism legitimizes a social order of exclusion. Religion is to be a moral consciousness of justice. Number two, religion in colonial modern space determines the political identity of the people. Dalits need a religion that can provide them with a political identity. So what is the role of religion? Giving its believers a socio-political identity, right? If you are again and again treated as slaves and untouchables within your religiosity, there is a problem with your religion. The role and the task of religion is to provide a new identity of freedom and justice. Unless, until it provides that, they name that religion. This is on that. And then third one, unlike Islam, Christianity, Buddhism has a capacity to challenge caste order. Sangha has a capacity to provide Dalits with a new subjectivity, Sangha. It is very close to the Christian theological understanding of discipleship, where you become part of a community of counter culture and develop yourself being and becoming for justice and freedom. Sangha, Sangam, Saranam, Vichami, Buddham, Saranam, Vichami. And Another one, religion as the political philosophy of Dhamma. Ambedkar never wants to call religion as religion. Ambedkar uses the word Dhamma, which means ethics. Unless and until your religion transforms your worldly life, the religion is waste, that is Ambedkar. The political becoming of subjects. It is not ritualistic, but practicing justice and morality. Religion as the ethical political practice of justice. According to Ambedkar, the role of religion is to promote practices of justice. Don't legitimize practices of exclusion, marginalization, discrimination on the basis of caste, color, creed, and your economic possessions. In Dhamma, ethics takes the place of God. It is not based on any notion of transcendence, 
but based on just practice of freedom and liberty. Dhamma is sacred because it stands for we and the one. In Ambedkar, there is no God as such, but Karuna, you know, compassion to the other is God. Ambedkar's political philosophy of Dhamma provides Christian theology to seek a deep, transcendent, sacred, and political liturgy of just practices in society. I think this is the challenge Nirmal has taken to retract Christianity, Christian theology, for the sake of the former untouchables that is in India. Let us see how Nirmal envisages Christianity as a Dalit religion in India. Ambedkar, uh, sorry, Nirmal, as uh, Dr. Peter Singh rightly said, emerged as a theology in the context of neo ambedkarism in the 1980s. There was Dalit movement all over India. Along with that, there was a Dalit Christian movement to challenge Christianity, to transform Christianity, to, to reconstruct Christianity in terms of the agency of Dalit Christians in India. According to Nirmal, I'm using his you know, basic book, Heuristic Exploration. Have you seen this book? It is another Gurugul's contribution published by Gurugul uh, Theological College. Heuristic Exploration. Religion for Nirmal is, 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 is a truth claim, not a truth, but it is a language of truth. It is a language of truth. It is not a truth claim. If you consider it as a truth claim, then it will offer its own regimes and colonies. It is not a regime of truth. It is a faith claim, truth claim. It is a language about God, about human beings. And that is why the title heuristic exploration. That means there is no given language. There is no given knowledge. There is no, no given truth at all. Truth is to be searched out by participating, participating in it. That is heuristic. Heuristic means you participate and earn knowledge, construct religion. So according to Nirmal, following the definitions of Dalit religion, according to Nirmal, religion is not given. It is to be constructed. It is, it is to be searched out. It is historical. So the religion should respond to the socio-political issues of society. For example, Advaita, wonderful philosophy, right? No, no dualism, nothing, all are one in Atman. But what is its role to respond to the socio-political issues of our society? Have you ever seen the Advaita people, uh, you know, uh, offer a resistance against the caste system? No, it is not at all a political philosophy. It is a metaphysics. So religion needs to be historical, political, and epistemic, knowledge-wise. Religion needs to be a respond, need to respond to the social political issues of the society. The only in India follows Brahmanic epistemology. That was his basic contention. Indian Christian theology follows the same Advaita Vedic philosophy. Advaita Vedanta and Vishishta Advaita. And he says that in a Lokayada, material philosophy has been forgotten by Christian theologists. Go back to the original philosophical traditions where you can define religiosity better than Christianity. This is Nirmal's contention. This materialist philosophy has the potential to offer a basis for a decastist, progressive, and secular theology in India. This is Nirmal, we can see in this book. And uh, the connection between Pratyaksha, inference and experience, Anubhava. Indian Christian theology was based on Anubhava. Anubhava means interiority. Nirmal says, without inference, without logic, your experience is meaningless. So, Dalit people brings their experience with their daily struggles, their logic of 
contention. So what happened in Indian Christian theology? They, they focused on Anubhava only, but that is interiority. Exteriority within religion, religion, truth within, transform yourself within it. But exteriority, our relationship with the other has never been tackled by Indian Christian theologists. This is Nirmal's intention. So the combination of Anubhava and Pratyaksha, in Kerala there is a Dalit religion which is called Pratyaksha Deva Sapa. Eh? Show me your salvation in, in our social relations. We cannot preach about salvation. But how does it, you know, become a reality in our daily life? Pratyaksha Raksha, salvation as a as, a, as an imminent experience of social reality. It should not be a metaphysics of a religion. So, um, uh, contradicting karma samsara, theology focuses on reconstruction of the self. Religion is the process of reinventing our own subjectivities, transform ourselves, if, if not, no use of religion. So according to Nirmal, Dalit theology envisages a correction in Christian theology. This is noted. Nirmal was not happy to receive accommodate Christianity as such, as it was in the case of Ambedkar. He was not happy with the Buddhism. He, you know, retranslated it, reconstructed it, which is called Navayana Buddhism. And in my argument, you know, Nirmal was not trying to accommodate Christianity as such, but he was trying to think about a counter Christianity, a Navayana Christianity in India through its doctrinal investigations. I'll go for that. Dalit theology envisages a correction in Christian theology by bringing Dalit pathos as the criteria of doing theology in India. So Nirmal asked the question, what is Christian in Dalit theology? His answer is, it is the Dalitness which is Christian about it. Dalit Christianity is not a foreign religion. Now, the central government has filed a, a submission in the High Court. Christianity as a foreign religion. So Dalit Christians cannot claim for their reservation. So the Nirmal said, you know, we have a a new Christianity, Navayana Christianity, where it is being translated into Indian indigenous tradition where there is no caste. So Dalit Christians in Christianity, not following the traditional Western Christianity, but envisaging a new Navayana Christianity, and what is that? Dalit theology and religion, normal has died. No, finally coming to the end of this presentation. Nirmal actually was trying to redefine doctrines in order to reconstruct Christianity. He was not just accommodating Christian doctrines as such. This is the point that I want to reiterate it in this presentation. What is Nirmal's understanding of God? Nirmal speaks about an imminent transcendent not the Christian God of Holy Abbas. Page number 115, it is very clear. Nirmal, following the Dalit religions, religious tradition in India, speaks about God, not as a super being, but as a potential, potentiality, actuality, and spirituality of matter within it, within it. Have you ever seen this definition of sacred? That is called, process theology. But, you know, Nirmal, years before, talked about a new God, God as a vitality of the world. The renewing spirit of this world, a de-transcendentalized sacred. Number two, for Bible, Nirmal, Nirmal, for Nirmal, Bible is not a, 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 a sacred text. It is a weapon of the weak, John Scott. And the basic tenant of biblical hermeneutics is the historical consciousness of Dalits. We know that his reading of Deuteronomy 24, 26, 5 to 12, my father was wandering 
Aramean, you know those. So reading uh, Bible, not for any metaphysical, mysterious messages, but for, you know, liberation of the people. This is a critical uh, edge in Dalit hermeneutics, uh, which is materialistic in content, which is materialistic in content. And the Jesus Christology, Dalit Christology, according to Nirmal, Jesus' Dalitness is the key to the mystery of his divine human unity. If you want to develop an authentic Christology, look at Dalits and their understanding of Christ. And because Dalit Christ lives in between the God of faith and history, and Christ of uh, mystery and history in between, and his cries, his lamentation, his grievances, uh, exemplify the weakness, vulnerability, and the lamentations of agony of the marvelous people called Dalit. So Jesus Christ is a de-transcendalized sacred God. This is a critique of Christianity. This is my point. And uh, pneumatology, pneumatology means, you know, the doctrine of spirit, doctrine of Holy Spirit. Nirmal speaks about a counter uh, pneumatology. It is not a Holy Spirit. Let me use the word uh, offered by Aruna Janavarasan. She speaks about brown spirit. In India, it is a brown people has brown spirit, eh? not a white spirit not a holy spirit as such, but it is a brown spirit that is ever growing spirit in us to, to go for transformation. I'm going to wind up. One day, uh, the, the, the tradition is like, you know, the liberation traditions, Sebastian Kapp and Samuel Ryan, those people followed uh, this, actually this normal tradition. In one class, one student asked uh, Samuel Ryan, Sir, how do you define this Holy Spirit? It is very difficult to understand. You know, Christian theology speaks about mystery, all those things, but really, what is it, uh, Holy Spirit? Then uh, uh, Samuel Ryan said, When you go out, just take out one piece of a sm small plant outside. Come back after two days. You'll see that there will be a new spring will be there. A new small plant will be there. And this is Holy Spirit. So explain. The Holy Spirit is nothing, nothing mysterious metaphysical image. It is an unending spirit of undeadness of Jesus on the cross. He will never die. You kill me, I will never die. Because you now it's ever groaning pain of the victims of this world. That is Holy Spirit. We have Holy, Holy Spirit. The marginalized people have Holy Spirit because they will never accept the defeat. The unstoppable, unending spirit of God to challenge all kinds of, you know, marginalizations and oppression. This is Holy Spirit, normal understanding of new metal. And finally, church is not a place of ritualism. You come and, you know, keep a distance, woman there, man here, transgender out, and then, you know, priest, hierarchy, all these things. There's, a, there's my fa very favorite philosopher and theologian. His name is Giorgio Agamben. Agamben, in his latest book, Church and Kingdom, he writes like this. He was speaking to the uh, bishops of Catholic Church in Paris. So he demanded to the, uh, the bishops of the Catholic Church, give me back my crucified Christ. You have become, made him Christ of high priest. My Christ is the crucified Christ. 
why you have made him Christ of high priest with the power and this all this tire from media my christ is a vulnerable christ so this is a, the church is not a place of ritualism but a, a body of the crucified people where they share their agony and they share their hopes of resilience in survival can we even think about such kind of a church gatherings you know eucharist is is that actually but our eucharist never asks us to go and stand in solidarity with the struggling masses around us the political meaning of church and sacraments let me conclude before uh, conclude this presentation sorry for taking too much time so then what could be nirmal's uh, final conclusion about christianity as a religion of dalits what things that he is offering to us as theological students to reread christianity as a religion dalit theology of religion stems from the critical engagement with the caste knowledge system if your religious tradition legitimizes any kind of social seclusion that is not at all the little religion not at all religion that is not at all christianity think about our christianity in india number 2 the little theology of religion envisions a paradoxical method where christianity is reconstituted christianity mark louis taylor theology professor at princeton university argues that the western christianity is colonial due to its transcendent concept of god god only other who can legitimize any divisions hierarchies and segregation in society so the slavo sisek according to slavo sisek you know short short down that god let him come down and eh? hunt down that god let him come down we need a god who can be embraced a god who can be embraced and for that we cannot follow a strict theism then anbakar will not be there in that religion there is no god in that so there is uh, not theism or atheism but it is a paradoxical ground multiple doxa ground where you can engage critically to challenge all you know systems of power and exclusion richard king speaks about anathemes you know inner religious inner culture inner ideological for a common uh, platform to to challenge all powers of uh, system power systems like caste patriarchy hierarchy and segregation and of course christian theology is challenged here when we read the uh, normal we need a new concept of god the transcendental sacred and there should be a new hermeneutics materialistic reading of scripture this is nothing new the notice some students you know that dominic person has done this so they see this picture dominic person when he speaks about the event of feeding the 5000 this is his sermon he says nothing mysterious metaphysic in that event people were willing to share their resources that's all this is material story why you bring that uh, mystery mystic things those things nothing bible speaks about justice just relation sharing was dominic crossan materialist really we need to come up with that this is normal uh, lead normal as a guide take us to think about the materialism of bible and sacram sacraments as the political practice of love justice and freedom think about our own sacred sacraments how do they empower us to stand for justice in society so 
the question that nirmal wants to ask this evening to us how do we envisage a new christian theology navayana christianity today in the midst of emerging religious fundamentalism and cultural fascism which is very important today let me conclude with the comment of uh, uh, dr rajaratnam about uh, nirmal arvind p nirmal this is the rajaratnam made a comment about nirmal in the very chapel of gurugul lutheran theology seminar this is the, the citation nirmal is a restless spirit that is searching for what is the most genuine response to the socio political and cultural ethos in which we find ourselves today rajaratnam on uh, nirmal nirmal is a restless spirit that is searching for what is the most genuine response to the socio political and cultural ethos in which we find ourselves today thank you what a powerful presentation in which he has brought several insights and challenges i think this i have heard several uh, lectures and today really it's fascinating the way he contends the entire theology of religions dalit theology dalit theology of religions and particularly uh, dr e p nirmal's contribution and he conceptualized and put it in a nutshell and challenges i could see the faces from the students and the community how you are benefited and how you are made the lecture now this is a time for us to ask questions and clarifications and to make comments further and atan is ready to respond to Oh, you have the mic here. Yes. Okay. Yes. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. I am very blessed with your lecture. My doubt is that. when we are constructing a dalit theology where is the position of the caste and the rich people are we excluding them we are or we are including or equal equal equalizing them i want to know that thank you so i need to comment uh, each one or uh, i'll collect questions and you know comment on last thank you dr vinay for the wonderful exposition of dalit theology of religion um i have uh, i i i need a clarification that um, are we christians talk about dalit theology or talk about the liberation of uh, liberation through dalit concept are we christians who talk about liberation through dalit experiences or are we already dalits as christians celebrating 
the theology of religion there is a, a lot of uh, uh, tension between these two positions can you help us to uh, get a way out of this okay. i can respond to these uh, questions quickly then i'll collect uh, questions if you have uh, um, after this and number one you know i was th i was uh, trying to portray the theology of religion as an invocation invocation for all the lists and if you want to call non lists to transform themselves to sangha discipleship and reformulate themselves in a relationship of fraternity so the question is not what to do with the rich what to do with the brahmins do we need to kill them or what no, that is not at all a question we are thinking about kind of a new religiosity where there is no ritual but practices of justice where we all become uh, you know partners of justice can we think about that kind of a religiosity because we have to think about it because we are not satisfied with the christian theology now hmm? and normal in his time was not happy with uh, the the normal christian theology of the west or indian as such because it never attempts to the pathos and ethos desires of the most marginal sections in india that was the problem. now dalit theology has grown up to even offer a theology of religion and even to criticize christianity to transform itself it started with normal that was my simple point number 2 uh that is that is a wonderful question i also have that question but if we agree that sir you, you know you know the answer that of that question uh but for me if we agree that there is a conflict between dalits and christianity and that itself is a great uh, uh, success because now dalit theologians are very comfortable with christians christianity as such but normal was not that that easy person to accommodate christianity he was trying to just like uh, ambedkar uh, engaged with the buddhism buddhism as a as a religion uh, can be a powerful system right what is happening in sri lanka myanmar but he was trying to retrust it but my point here is that dalit theologians are not in a position to retrust christianity as it was initiated by normal that is my point then we should ask the question how how we are going to acknowledge and address the conflict between dalit and the so see there is a strong tradition of dalit religiosity Christianity also has a long tradition, Western uh, doctrine and all those things. But when they come together, it is not a a, a place of uh, you know compromise, but it is a a place of conflict and difference. And now theologians want to ask the question: What is the difference? in order to retrap dalit religion and christianity mm -hmm. sir i am not uh, arguing that you know christianity should come to should become a dalit religion of lmn or mari mutuamman no we have gone through those things we have gone through ambedkar historical tradition now the question is that we have a christianity are we does our christianity it took itself to understand the difference and conflict offered by dalit religiosity 
I think I hope that I am clear now. That this is the challenge, but we need to address how. We cannot just go and uh, you know receive doctrines as such. We need to ask questions. How? How Eucharist? How baptism is becomes an anti-casteist practice today? Why there is a, a, you know segregation, holy and unholy place in the religious system? Unless and until you ask the question, Dalits cannot find a proper space in Christianity. That was the contribution of Dalits, uh, normal, to retranslate Christianity and uh, envisage a Navayana Christianity. That is one. Okay. There are questions from uh, online scholars. Uh, I have a question. Just normal find any resources in modern Marxism that will enrich the indigenous resources of Charvaka, Lokaita tradition for a materialist, immanent theology and practice which is normal or rather you classified as pre brahmanic I ask this because Ambedkar also rejected Marxism finally in favor of Buddhism in his work, Buddha and his Dhamma. Very interesting question. Uh, this was uh, my PhD dissertation. Uh, how Ambedkar used these three, three resources, uh, Lokaida and uh, Buddhism and Marxism. As you rightly said, sir, Abel Raj, Ambedkar was not ready to accept Marxism as such, because as you know, Marxism cannot address the question of casteism. But Ambedkar used the style of Marxism that, that criticized metaphysical Christianity, metaphysical Western Christianity. So there are many uh, books, works on it. For example, for your information, read Anupama Rao. Title of the book is Caste. So how Ambedkar is, as a brilliant academician, using uh, these three resources, but not putting himself in any one of these traditions. He was not a Marxist. He was not a pure Buddhist. He was not a, a pure Lokayate. Because, you know, after the trajectory, historical trajectories, he, he has come up with his own uh, political philosophy of Dhamma, selectively using Marxism. So your, uh, your contention is right. Ambedkar was not at all Marxist, but Ambedkar used, there are many materials. For example, you know, Ambedkar used the strategy of political strategy of making trade union. Ambedkar formed a trade union and he contested in the parliament election from Maharashtra. He lost uh, that tradition. These things uh, Ambedkar received uh, from Marxism. Another question. Um, Dalit religion has an intrinsic relationship with nature. Indigenous religions are all ecocentric. Does Nirmal bring any eco theological perspective of religion? That's also a wonderful question. We need to initiate some discussions. This is uh, Theophilus, right? Hi, how are you? Okay, wonderful question, Theophilus. Yeah, the understanding of world, matter, and body itself opens up a new elemental theology which the Western eco theology cannot understand. Before you go to eco theology, learn from Nirmal how does he validate? validate matter, body, and world. Throwing resources from, you know, Lokayata, Marxism, and uh, Buddhism. There is an inherent elemental theology. Matter is vibrant. This is very much connected with the uh, process philosophy. 
And there is an echo theology. Somebody has to do a research on it. This is my response to that idea. Nirmal never talked about echo theology, the stand pure echo theology, nature loving things, nothing. But he was a lover of matter, substance. And his ecology should be drawn from the from his understanding of spirit as a, a ever groaning spirit within the ecology. And there lies Nirmal's um, counter echo theology. Somebody, someone has to do a research on it. Thank you, Theophilus. Thank you very much, sir, for a very wonderful lecture. It was very systematic. And uh, I have uh, two questions. So uh, the first is, uh, we were taught that uh, uh, Hinduism has divided into four varnas, that is Brahman, Brahm Brahmini, Kshatriya, and Vaishnava Sudra. So then what ground and Rinbal says that it is different, as you told that it is a Dalit religion. It is a, a religion uh, which is of show, which is com coming out of social movement. So, like primal religion, I can say. So, what is the connection between Hinduism, which are uh, Hinduism, which is saying that it is a one of the four varna, and uh, here Nirmal uh, is saying that it is a social, it is a social movement. Then second is why we need Dalit religion because uh, according to my uh, understanding it is one kind of promoting uh, uh, one kind of thing that is promoting casteism again can we talk about a religion where there is equality no division in terms of caste and class so thank you sir. Thank you, my friend, for these meaningful questions. Uh, number one, according to uh, Nirmal and any Dalit theologians, religion is not a metaphysics. Religion is not just a mystery. Religion is not a system of rituals. Religion is a critical social movement that empowers its worshippers, believers, to have a new subjectivity, new identity, new humanity. That is the role of religion. So Dalit religion, as a contested religion, as a, as a conflictual religion, as a religion that challenges the dominant conceptions of religion in India, especially Vedic religion, Hindutva religion, Hindu religion. And it is a critic of the Semitic uh, militant religions like Christianity and Islam. You know, a militant text, militant scripture as the final. So the Dalit religion, theology of religion, takes a new root. It is not just one among the many. It is not just one among the many. But it is a critical. Look at the Dalit religion. How does it define religion? How does it define the role of a worshipper? How does it define ritual, puja, all these things? So there is a religion in the, in India, come from which comes from indigenous tradition. You know, gives us a new impetus, imagination about a religion as a historical, socio-political movement, which gives us new transformation. That is the significance and importance of Dalit theology. It is not uh, promoting casteism. See, this is the question we uh, theological teachers used to listen from uh, our students. When we begin Dalit theology class, Dr. Peter, uh, the first question, sir, why we need uh, Dalit theology? 
we have christian theology which is comprehensive of all these things and why dalit theology then i asked the question how many gospel you have in your bible sir four why we need four gospels we need only the why we why why there is there are four gospels in bible then the students will say that you know because different interpretations different articulations of jesus christ dalit theology give the right to dalits to define jesus christ it is not to why we need uh, indian christian theology there is christian theology why indian christian theology why sri lankan theology why latin american theology because these are different imaginations of god human being nature so dalit theology as a critical imagination gives us new impetus to think about god church religion this is a prophetic movement listen carefully what does it speak as the brown spirit speaks every day hmm? Dr. Sangram, you keep your theological questions with you. I will try to answer later. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much for this great, great honor. To come to a place for me where I started learning Dalit theology. It was Guru Guru that prompted me to look into Dalit theology as a research. Thank you, Guru Guru. Thank you, Dr. Sangram. Thank you all. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much, Achan. Now, may I request our principal to uh, make a concluding remarks. And then I request Dr. Edwin to offer the closing prayer and benediction, followed by a vote of thanks from Mrs. Rebecca. I don't want to spoil what is gone before. I will not speak nothing. <laughs> then we have had enough. But it is really, really a opportunity to read the theology of the original pioneers and then listen from the modern theologians. Maybe third generation or second generation Dalit theologians in form of white veneras. So, thank you, sir, for a future generation. So, thank you so much. Just I'd like to once again acknowledge the presence of uh, some of the people online, along with us, the Rekul Committee here in this auditorium. Henrik Rosen, thank you for patiently joining and listening to all these lectures from YT Benares. And then family of AP Nirmal, those who are here online. So thank you so much. Then I'm not much familiar with some of the participants here, like uh, Jayakar Ras, and then another Ras. I'm, I'm sorry, I couldn't collect where are the names. Yeah. So thank you so much, everybody. And then our colleague, Atola Lankuma, thank you for joining with us throughout the session. And then all other online participants, along with our BD2 students and some of the faculties of Gosnell Theological College, thank you so much for joining with us. God bless us all together and help us to articulate more theology, which is relevant for the struggling people in our church and society. Thank you.
Shall we look to the Lord in prayer? We thank you, God, our mother and father in heaven, for Dr. A.P. Nirmal, your servant. As we remember his life, honor his legacy, and celebrate his contributions to Indian Christian theology, we thank you. We thank you that he has illuminated our lives through his contextual theological articulations by bearing your image. We pray for his family members, Melind, Makaren, Elizabeth, and the family members. Lead them and bless them that they may continue to reflect your glory and brighten the lives of many. We also pray for today's speaker, Dr. Vinayaraj, that he may continue to be an effective instrument in your hand in the ministry of leading many into the truth. We offer prayers for Gurugul and UELCI. Our God, as we rejoice in this day, we pray for wisdom, bravery, and strength so that we can continue our ministry of empowering the disciples to bring about peace and justice on earth. Amen. Let us all join together in saying the Lord's Prayer. Our parent God in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your reign come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, Forgive our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the reign, power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Let us receive the benediction. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit rest and abide with us now and forever. Amen. On behalf of the Endowment Lecture Committee, I stand here to say the word of thanks. At the outset, we as a committee would like to thank God Almighty for enabling us to successfully complete yet another, another endowment lecture. We would like to thank our guest speaker, Reverend Dr. Y.T. Vinayaraj, for his inspiring lecture on Dalit theology of religion, Nirmal as guide. Thank you, sir. We would like to thank our principal for his continuous support in this endeavor. We would like to thank all the participants who participated in this program, especially Reverend Dr. Bovas, Reverend Dr. Edwin for offering the opening prayer and the closing prayer. We would like to thank the college choir for the beautiful button that they rendered to us. We thank the moderator, Reverend Dr. Peter Singh, for chairing the lecture. We thank the GLTC media team for all the technical arrangements uh, for the online live streaming. Especially, we would like to thank Reverend Dr. Samuel Sundarajan Singh. We, we thank the MESS committee under the leadership of Reverend Dr. David Joseph Raj for the tea that they gave to us. Thank you all for participating and thank you all the online participants. Once again, thank you to the committee members for their support in making this program a great success. Thank you one and all.